story of the life of Emile Zola begins in Venice, where his father was born Francesco Zola in 1795 into a family of civil servants and military officers. During Napoleon's takeover of Europe, Zola joined the army as a second lieutenant. He took a degree in mathematics at the University of Padua and appears to become a military engineer. However, when Austria took over Venice from Napoleon, life under foreign powers became too difficult, and he, along with many other political refugees, left Italy never to return. He worked first in Vienna on various railway schemes, but after many years of struggle, he ended up in Marseille, where public engineering projects in water supplies and transport seemed to be blossoming. Much of his time he spent in Paris, trying to get government permission for his various engineering schemes. There he met and married Emily Aubert in March 1839. He was 44 and she was 20. Emily Zola was the daughter of a seamstress and a house painter, so there was little money and little background. However, her husband felt she was beautiful and would make him a fine wife. In the new block of 10 Rue Saint-Joseph, near the Bourse, their son Emile was born in March 1840. François Zola, he had made his name more French-sounding, was at the time projecting to build a canal from Aix-en-Provence to Marseille, and finally, in March 1843, they settled in Aix to begin the project. It should have meant a prosperous life for the Zola family, and at first it was. In a spacious house, close to the old cathedral of Aix, Emile basked in the love and devotion of his parents, until suddenly his father died of pleurisy, his dam and his canal not yet begun. Ultimately the dam was built. Here it still lies in the shadow of the great Mont Saint-Victoire, and the canal from it, the Zola Canal, brought water to the parched plains around Aix. The dam was very advanced for its time, but though he was honoured in his death by the people of Aix, his widow was left with nothing but a string of lawsuits attempting to establish family rights in the canal company. Life in Aix got progressively more difficult for Emily Zola and her son, and she struggled to have him educated. By 1852, when he was 12, he entered this school, then known as the College Bourbon, the best school in Aix. The town council paid for a scholarship for the boy, some recompense for his mother's efforts. In academic terms he did well, but his most enduring experience at the school was the friendship of two boys, Paul Cézanne, himself to become a world-famous painter, and Jean-Baptiste Baye, the son of a local hotel keeper. The three boys were soon inseparable, and although Zola was naturally given to melancholy and unsociability, he looked on their friendship as one of the best parts of his youth. That he got along so well with Paul Cézanne says much for Zola's sensitivity. Cézanne had an extremely difficult and prickly personality. Large, ungainly, but quite as intelligent as Zola, Cézanne was permanently locked in battle with his wealthy but mean and difficult father, who was derisive about his ambitions to be an artist. The countryside of Provence has an unforgettable beauty, and the river arc to the south of the town where they swam, and the hills over which they wandered made a huge impression on them.
Mont Saint Victoire was to be the subject of Cézanne's maturity, to which he never tired of returning. For Zola, the countryside and the city of Aix itself developed in him a sense of place, which was to be so formidable a part of his armory as a novelist. Apart from nature, there was, of course, the world of literature. Hugo was one of his idols. Hugo's influence as a poet and novelist on all writers of his age was enormous. Zola, in whom a social conscience was always alive, was likewise influenced by Hugo's commitment to liberty and democracy, even while he was incarcerated in exile on Guernsey. Alfred de Musset was apparently the poet who came to take first place in the influences that played on Zola and Cézanne. He was less tyrannical in his rhetoric than Hugo. However it was, Zola hungrily devoured all the works of his generation, and in his letters to Cézanne and Bay, we learn much of the problems that beset him in his literary quests. When Zola was 18, and before he had finished his education in Aix, his mother Emily, still chasing her lost rights, decided they would both move to Paris. Influence got him a place at the prestigious Lycée Louis Le Grand, but he found that success in Aix did not easily translate into success among the brighter echelons of Paris youth. When he took his baccalaureate, he did well in everything except the oral, which he failed. It was a great blow. A visit to Aix and Paul, who was now at law school, revived him sufficiently to attempt to reset his exams in Marseille, but it went no better, and he found himself with a good secondary education behind him, but no qualification. At least he could not be pushed into the professional post his mother coveted for him. But it was not a happy situation when he had his mother to support and no job. Paris and poverty loomed large, and after feeble attempts at job seeking, by spring 1860 he had found work in the customs department where he stayed miserably for less than a year. A friend of his father found him a position in the distribution department of the publisher Hachette, still today one of the great names in French publishing. It was all he needed, a secure job, a chance to learn the publishing trade and meet the right people, and Zola, whose only ambition was to be a writer, set out with typical practicality to ensure that he could bring it off. Achette was a great stroke of luck in many ways. His qualities were quickly appreciated and he was made director of the publicity department and eventually advertising manager. Through his work he made good literary connections and developed a talent for publicity which was to be of great use in his career. His life improved by great leaps and bounds. By 1863 he and his mother had taken a better flat in the Rue des Feuillantines off the Rue Saint-Jacques. He worked assiduously, building up the connections with newspapers who reviewed the books Achette published and who would later review his own novels. He began writing for these journals and newspapers and this journalism was to form the financial background of his life for many years. He moved to the Rue de Vaugirard near the Luxembourg Gardens and by 1863 Paris had begun to be a pleasant place for him. He started entertaining artistic friends on Thursday evenings where they came to drink tea and talk into the night. It became a regular part of his life from then on. His boyhood friend, Paul Cézanne, was now in Paris and together the two friends visited the studios of the painters Renoir, Basile, Fontaine Latour, Monet and Degas these early connections were to prove crucial in establishing Zola's reputation as an art critic in years to come.
Les Contes à Ninon, a volume of short stories, was Zola's first published work. His professional background helped him find a publisher and develop good publicity and distribution. Usually, a writer was paid once for the first printing. The publisher then took all royalties after that, so of course, in a successful work, all the profits stayed with the publisher. Zola arranged all publicity and fixed a royalty on all sales after the first run, in this case of 1,500 copies. It was an important move, and writing and publishing as a business, as well as authorship, was how Zola operated from then on. His first novel, La Confession de Claude, came out the following year, dedicated to Cézanne and Bai, and was well promoted, as became his habit. It was about a young provincial idealist who comes to Paris and discovers the vice and corruption of the capital. The harsh realism of his writing produced something of a scandal, so Achette were not sorry when he decided to leave the firm in 1866. He was confident he could survive on his writing alone. A couple of years before, he had met Alexandrine Mele. Described as tall, olive-skinned and distinguished-looking, she had had an uneasy early life as the daughter of a hatter and a florist, born in the Sentier district, near where Zola's parents had first lived in Paris. In character, she seems to have been very like Zola's mother. Alexandrine made him an excellent wife, bolstering his confidence and restraining his foolishness. But sadly, their marriage was to be childless. Newspapers and journals provided Zola with a steady income, and in the newspaper Le Figaro, he became the leading art critic with his bold opinions on the annual Salon. Of course, he upheld the work of Manet and Pizarro, Cezanne and Fontaine Latour, whose work could not even get a showing in the academically biased Salon exhibition. Zola was very effective in his defence of his artistic stable. In 1866, to espouse Manet, Monet and Pizarro was daring to a degree. Readers tore up the newspapers and cancelled their subscriptions. They were so incensed by his articles. Manet painted this famous portrait of him. With hindsight, we know that Zola showed astonishing discernment and, of course, he was greatly valued by Manet and his other artist friends. He sent 60 francs a month to the impoverished Cezanne for many years and constantly helped other painters financially when he could, so his support of art was steady and, as usual with him, practical. He wrote a great deal about literature in the many articles he produced. Realism was his byword, though any labelling of his own work, as with most writers, only tells part of the story. In fact, his journalistic background was the basis of his then singular approach to novel writing. Victor Hugo, the greatest of all romantic writers, rarely moved from his study when he wrote, relying on his imagination and his memory for the background to his stories. Zola's approach, while of course ultimately producing imaginative work, always started with some deliberate research. Zola needed it to get him going, but also because the external realism of his descriptions was his great strength, and it lay in acute observation. When he came to write a novel set in one of the wondrous new department stores, for a month he toured them, looking into all the details of their operation, and filled 100 pages of his notebooks with his observations on their systems and the lives of the people who worked there. The result in this case was Au Bonheur des Dames, To the Happiness of Women, a fascinating story with its background, the great shopping emporiums, which have become so much a part of our lives. 
True to his nature, Zola's greatest success in novel writing came as a result of a thoughtful plan for a succession of novels, which would not only keep him busy for a long time, but help to build up readers eager to read the next novel in the series. It was not an entirely new approach in French literature. Balzac, in his Comédie Humaine, had produced a large number of linked novels. Zola's approach, however, started from his own early background in Aix, which, in his novels, he called Plassans, and two families which he grounded there, the Rougon and the Macquart, who became the basis of his splendid series of 20 novels known as the rougon macquart novels. It followed the ups and downs of various members of these families, usually locked in enmity and certainly torn by adversity. He drew a map of his imaginary town, Plassans, which has the circular layout of Aix, and he also worked out the family trees of the characters in the series. Zola was, of course, tempted to write for the theatre. Hugo had done it, but it was not Zola's Jean, and three flops persuaded him to let others do the stage adaptations of his novels. His work was so popular that adaptations there had to be, just as we would make screenplays for the cinema today. He was naturally paid and made another fortune from stage versions of such works as La Somoire and Nana when they reached theatres in Paris and around the world. Zola was undoubtedly a man fulfilled. He enjoyed great success in his art. He was an excellent craftsman and a disciplined and creative writer in the best sense. As a human being, he was not without his faults. Who is? But the country house he bought at Medan, to the west of Paris, reflected the success he enjoyed, gave him a delightful refuge from the bustle of Paris and allowed him to show some of the finer sides of his character. He built there a huge workroom on the top floor of a new wing. He added wings for his guests. He improved his garden. He made himself a darkroom and became a passionate photographer. He learned to ride a bicycle. But above all, he invited and entertained his friends. The railway which brought them from Paris passed the bottom of his garden. He enjoyed the noise and bustle of the trains going by, just as he enjoyed the pleasure of showing his friends around his garden. Zola was a good friend to many, as usual, supporting several struggling writers and artists with money and encouragement. His friends were happy to come to Medan. He was not at all irregular or bohemian in his tastes and habits, and longed for the family it seemed he and his wife could not have. He met Jeanne Rosero for the first time in May 1888. She was 21 and a chambermaid in their house, hired by his wife, Alexandrine. He was soon deeply in love. He persuaded her to give in her notice, and he ensconced her in a flat near their Paris home. He began a secret double life. It was to give him the great happiness of two children, and when Alexandrine found out, a great deal of trouble. However, he made it clear to her that he recognized she had been a good wife to him and he would stick by her. Eventually, his wife even acknowledged the children who were to become so dear to him. After he finished the 20 novels which make up the rougon macquart series, Zola turned to new but equally controversial fields. He wrote a series of three novels under the heading of The Three Cities, Les Trois Villes. The cities were Lourdes, Rome and Paris. He began with Lourdes because he saw the pilgrimages there as a calculated fraud on the part of the church. Emotional capital was being squeezed out of the sufferings of the poor pilgrims who struggled so hard to get there, believing they would be cured. The novel is about a young priest who, through his exposure to all this, begins to question his faith in God. In the next book, Rome, 
center of the Roman Catholic Church, the same priest encounters the scheming of the leaders of the church for their own advancement. In the final work, Paris, Zola turns his attention to the business world, where his contemporaries were so often being duped into investing their money in spurious businesses, which spectacularly failed. In 1894, President Carnot was assassinated by an anarchist in a wave of business scandals and terrorist unrest, and as usual, Zola was topical and potent. This last work, however, was overshadowed by Zola's personal involvement in the Dreyfus affair. He wrote his famous letter, J'accuse. Zola was 58, at the height of his powers, honoured and acclaimed by many, though abhorred by many also. Yet in this letter he put everything he had gained at stake. Given the circumstances in France at the time, it could even be said he risked his life. An army officer of good report, Captain Dreyfus was wrongly accused of giving military secrets to the Germans. Although the evidence was flimsy and pointed at another officer as the culprit, Dreyfus was condemned by a military court and sent to life imprisonment on Devil's Island. Although soon aware of their errors, the military high command did not wish to admit to making a mistake, and the fact that Dreyfus was a Jew added to the unlikelihood of his being released, pardoned, or given restitution. It was a sorry mess, and the whole nation joined in. J'accuse was the article through which Zola declared himself, and accused the army so directly and bluntly of wrongdoing that he was tried, and of course found guilty of treason, and had to flee to England. In the eyes of the establishment, he was poison but to the democratically minded, and particularly to the young, he was noble. He lived variously in Surrey, just outside London, for about a year, while the Dreyfus affair continued to tear France apart. Dreyfus was not just about a Jew who was victimised, but a symptom of the corruption in the French army, bureaucracy and government, which Zola so despised. At the time, in England, nothing so noble was going on in literature. London was obsessed with Oscar Wilde and his sexual meanderings, and Ernest Zola and his support of Dreyfus must have seemed almost incomprehensible to the British establishment for whom artists meant rather little. They were certainly not expected to interfere in politics. He returned to Paris in January 1899, when a general amnesty was declared over the affair and those concerned in it. It was not over, of course, and in fact he did not live to see Dreyfus totally exonerated and given back his commission in the army. While the Dreyfus affair was going on, he began a new series of novels which he called Les Quatre Évangiles. This translates as The Four Gospels, though he used the word gospel ironically. Fecundity, work, truth and justice were the titles. He finished three and justice remained unwritten. These novels, overshadowed still by the rougon Macart series, were typical of the positive, life-affirming, optimistic Zola, never afraid to uncover the seemiest sides of life, but always ready to believe in the virtuous possibilities of mankind at the same time. Zola's end was a tragedy. He was busy on a novel. He was happy in his children. But one night, while in his Paris house, his chimney got mysteriously blocked, and he and his wife were found the next day gassed by carbon monoxide fumes from his fire. She recovered, he did not. It was a sudden and unlooked-for end, and there were suspicions that it might have been murder. Certainly there were those who hated his work and his influence so much that they might have engineered such a thing. The pen has always been a great deal mightier than the sword, 
and the man of ideas and imagination who can write as Zola could is a great threat to people who don't agree with him. In his huge output of novels, he made his mark on literature and society, as so few writers have done, so successfully, so powerfully, and reaching at the same time such a wide audience. He had a strong social conscience, of course, but he understood life too well to preach. Above all, he was a storyteller of great power and imagination. Through his characters and their lives, he entertains and illuminates the minds of his readers today, just as much as when he wrote. No writer could do more. Zola was very industrious as a writer in more than one field. However, he is best known as a novelist, and of his novels, only a small number are widely available in translation. His work may be divided into four groups. Miscellaneous pieces, mostly journalism, short stories, plays and opera libretti, and novels. Miscellaneous pieces. When he began writing as a young man, journalism was his financial mainstay, and even later in life, he continued to write steadily for journals about art and literature in particular. Of note is his essay of 1880, Le Roman Experimental, The Experimental Novel. In 1881, he wrote Le Naturalisme au Théâtre, Naturalism in the Theatre. Nos auteurs dramatiques about contemporary dramatists and Les Romanciers Naturalistes about novelists writing in a naturalistic style. Finally, in 1898, he wrote the article criticizing the government over the Dreyfus affair, which eventually led to his exile, called J'accuse, meaning he accused the government. Flaubert and Victor Hugo, amongst other French writers, had both suffered either imprisonment or exile for what they wrote, so Zola must have seen it as par for the course. The next group is short stories. His first group, Les Contes à Ninon, was one of his first published efforts, and he went on writing short stories for most of his writing life, mostly published in journals. 1874 saw more Contes à Ninon. 1882, a collection called after one of the stories, Le Capitaine Boule. And finally, in 1883, a collection headed by Naïs Mikoulin. Few of these stories are easily available in translation. Zola was always interested in the theatre, and the next group, Plays and Opera Libretti, reflect this. His first two efforts in 1873, an adaptation of his melodramatic novel Thérèse Raquin, and in 1874 a play with a short story behind it, Les Héritiers Rabourdins, were not very successful. He then began a fruitful collaboration with a playwright called William Busnach, and together they turned five major novels into very successful plays, which were translated and played abroad in the wake of the novels. In 1879, L'Assemblée. In 1881, Nana. In 1883, Pau In 1886, Le Ventre de Paris. In 1891, Le Rêve was the basis of an opera by Alfred Bruno, and its success led to two more operas based on Zola's works, L'Attaque du Moulin in 1893 and Messidor in 1897. Zola did the libretto alone for Messidor, 
and though the music was a success, many found fault with Zola's efforts. Novels Helped by his contacts in the publishing world, Zola launched his first novel, La Confession de Claude, in 1865. By 1868, he'd published five novels and agreed with a publisher to write a series of 20 novels based on the fortunes of two families, the Rougon and the Macquart. It began with La Fortune des Rougon in 1871, and by the time he got to La Sombre in 1877, he had made his name throughout France and was already recognized internationally as the writer of realistic novels. He was not afraid to depict in sometimes horrifying detail the lives of the poor and the way in which they had to do battle to improve their lot. With Nana, in 1880, he had a particular hit, and in 1882, with Au Bonheur des Dames, which was about the lives of people working in the new giant department stores, his thorough preparation for his novels was becoming legendary. He spent much time in the stores watching people at work, just as he spent time on the footplates of trains before writing another great success, La Bête Humaine, in 1890. The series ended with Dr. Pascal in 1893, but he was at once off on another track, beginning a series of three novels based on cities, Lourdes in 1894, Rome in 1896, and Paris in 1898. Written with his usual determination to uncover the truth, they dealt in particular with the distortions of the Roman Catholic religion which had bedeviled France for so long. It was not long before state schools forbade the promotion of any religion in their courses, something they have maintained to this day. At his death in 1902, he was at work on yet another series of four novels, but completed only three. The essence of Zola's work will be found in Germinal of 1885, a powerful work about a mining community and the harsh reality which faced them when the miners went on strike. La Terre of 1887, an emotionally charged tale about peasants living an almost bestial life on the edge of French society. And La Bête Humaine, about the effect of the railways on human development along with a tale of a murderer and the primal causes of his act. These make gripping reading and are readily available in translation.